coastline of the Baltic Sea seems infinite when seen from a height of 2,000 meters. The people in northern Germany feel a close bond to their coastal heritage. An artist decrypts messages from the sea. Pankow is brimming with hills and lakes, reminiscent of Swiss landscapes. The stud is home to a proud horse breed. Today, Baltic coasts will follow the scenic route leading from Kiel to Lübeck. The Baltic Sea. People have been travelling along its horizon ever since the Grand Migration period. It is the main route between Scandinavia in the north, Russia in the east and Germany in the south. The steep cliffs lining the bay have been Siemens' cherished landmarks for centuries. Large ferries commute between Germany and Scandinavia. Their destination here is Kiel, a harbour city situated by a long arm of the sea. Halfway across Kiel's fjord, next to a small lighthouse, the last stronghold of old seafaring romance is found. A maritime cafe at the pier, run by an old sailor. People with a yearning for the far away meet up here once a week to escape their workday life. Doing the tango Argentine, they can let their mind wander off to foreign shores. Tango has a bit of image. Tango has got a bit of an immoral image. It used to be performed in the harbour. Tango is all about desire, just like the sea and the ships. It always awakes a longing to travel. If I get on the dance floor with a beautiful woman in my arms, it also has to do with this type of yearning. Tango originates from the quayside bars of Buenos Aires. It has found a new home in this maritime cafe in Kiel. Ernst Hinzmann used to roam the oceans as a skipper before returning ashore to fulfill his biggest dream. The warehouse at Thiessen Pier belonged to the last ship chandler here, the legendary Hermann Thiessen. He provided sailors from all over the world with goods for their journey. His shop was the first address for those in search of duty-free schnapps and other goods before continuing their journey through the Baltic. Grandpa Tissen had everything. Captain fought like a piano aboard, Tissen got him a piano. Crew fought like a dog on the ship, so mutt was organized in no time. Today, a ship chandler does his job via the phone. You know, finds some wholesaler and goes like, drive here and there now, ship lies off for 15 minutes and the deal's got to be done by then. The music of the tango is carried through the harbour. Everyone is welcome to appease their longing for the far away with a dance. All it takes is a beer or a coffee in Ernst's Maritime Café. The heart of Kiel is found at the end of the vast fjord, its domestic port. Kiel is Germany's leading harbour city when it comes to ferry trips and cruises. During the summer, one can watch up to six giant cruise liners moored in the harbour simultaneously. The locking of ships and their passengers takes place within a few hours. Dockers have got their hands full with the loading and unloading of cargo.
It's an impressive sight to watch the cruise liners plane out of the fjord of Kiel. Their travels may take them to St. Petersburg, Stockholm, Helsinki or Oslo. Every year, the world's best sailors gather here during Kiel Week. They have trained hard for their shot at glory in the world's largest sailing event. Amongst them are skipper Kirsten Hamstoff and her pink crew. This ship is usually manned by six guys, and we're sailing with 14 women instead. We're placing two women instead of one man in certain positions. Ultimately, the quality of teamwork decides a race. The pink crew has been sailing together for 15 years on several ships. Organization is really important when there are so many people involved. It's not an easy task to ensure that everyone has a set position and that all actions will link up smoothly. The Tutema sails up to 30 knots. It's a superb racing yacht. But winning isn't what it's all about for them. The ambitious ladies want to have fun while doing it. The girls are either students or work for shipping companies. There's no space for husbands or boyfriends here in the harbour. The sailor Amazons are a sworn-in crew. Skipper Kirsten grew up sailing in the Baltic Sea. She had the idea for the Amazons ship when she was 18. We don't have this hierarchy here where one goes, hey, I'm the skipper and all of you are my worker bees. We never had that vibe here. We have always been a team and decisions are made in a democratic fashion. Of course, someone needs to have the last word in a stressful situation. But generally, we're all equal here. Kirsten and her crew have had the chance to race with this yacht for two years now. A German clockmaker's firm sponsors them to participate in international races now. Their racing yacht's value is set at 3 million euros. They want to cause a stir in the years to come. The peninsula Vagrin is to be found south of Kiel's large bay. The face of the coastline has not changed here since the arrival of the first settlers in the region. Birgit Rautenberg Sturm lives right behind the steep cliffs. She has found a unique way to tell the story of the coast and seafaring through printmaking. Every artist chooses the medium he feels most comfortable with. You create what you feel is most important to you. I'm not the kind of person that can sit down on the beach and paint with watercolors. The sea produces my artwork, and I just add on to this to give it the finishing touches. Um die Sache dann rund zu kriegen. 
Birgit drops zinc plates sewn into linen into the ocean. She has them resting at the bottom of the sea for several months. The wind and the waves are Birgit's accomplices. She carefully polishes new zinc plates and sews them into sailcloth. Everyone in my family went to sea. There are captains and stewards to be found in our family tree. In fact, my grandmother was the first woman around here who wore trousers when sailing. Das fand ich schick. So. I grew up with all her stories about the sea and it became a part of me. Birgit and her husband restore vintage sailing boats. Today they navigate through the main fairway into the Bay of Kiel. Turbulence is in the water and oxidation will mould their patterns onto her plates. Like this, she is able to map the traces left by shipping traffic. Each dumping site is marked with a buoy so that Birgit can retrieve her works in progress. I had the idea for this ten years ago. We were sailing to Norway and I took a zinc plate along that I had wrapped in linen. I dangled it from the lean bow in every harbour we visited. It was supposed to capture our itinerary. Birgit's plates are made of zinc, a metal that has been used in shipbuilding for ages. Every ship has got zinc anodes that serve to protect the most valuable parts. Screws, bolts and nails mustn't erode, so the zinc anodes are attached to them to prevent the corrosion. These are called sacrificial anodes, and a zinc plate is the same as them, really. I'm 100% sure that everything these plates experience down there will be etched into their surface. Those holes are a gift from the ocean. I accept my gift and make it visible to others on land. The corrosion pattern left by the sea will only form the artwork's backdrop. Birgit will add the poetry of her emotions to refine the piece. We continue the journey from Kiel's outer fjord to one of the most beautiful areas found on Germany's coasts called Holstein, Switzerland. This is due to the many hills, lakes and forests found here. Our destination is Stod Panka. A lookout post towers 130 meters above sea level. It was erected by the Count of Hesher in the 19th century.
the extensive forest districts are home to several herds of fallow deer. During rutting season, the stag's distinctive roars echo through the woods. The landscape surrounding the Hessian stone attracts riders in particular, and there is a special reason for this. Below the tower, Studpanka with its dreamy manor house lies bedded into a beautiful English park. Still today, the descendants of the powerful Hessian landgraves are living here. Their aristocratic lineage dates all the way back to the 14th century. Kings and queens have visited Panka because of its beautiful location near the Baltic Sea. Stud Panka has been the home to the Trichinum breed ever since the end of World War II. These tall horses were famous in the Prussian Empire. They used to be bred predominantly in eastern Prussia, now Poland. Some horses immediately catch your eye. You may think, wow, what a character. And there are other ones which you'd only notice second time around. It's quite similar with humans, isn't it? And probably those will turn out to be the better ones. The breeder proudly presents one of his show horses, the seven-year-old mare aptly named Blood from the Heart. She has all the characteristics of a full-blooded trachina. You don't need to be a horse expert to see that she's not only very pretty, but that she's got character too. The fur is glossy and she's well proportioned. She's got flawless legs, you can see the tendons and sinews shining through. That's important, the legs have to be hard. The main stud Trukinen in eastern Prussia had been raised to the ground at the end of World War II. In 1945, a trek of fugitives left with 20 Turkin and mares in tow. Stud Panker gave the few surviving horses a new home and took up breeding again. Sie können davon ausgehen, dass Stud Panker is a renowned cradle of the Turkin and breed. Our horses have spread all over the globe from here. If you see a trachina anywhere in the world and you look at its pedigree, I bet you are going to find a horse that was born in Panka somewhere along the bloodline. Still today, the East Prussian Moosehorn is the branding of a thoroughbred trachina. It's the last reminder of the original stud trachinan. The mix of English and Arabic fullbloods makes a sturdy breed perfect for cross-country and long-distance rides. Those climbing the Hessian stone today will be rewarded with one of the greatest lookouts at the coast. If the weather is right, one could look straight across the Baltic Sea all the way to Denmark's shores. Around the city shores of Heiligenhafen, a microcosm of colourful lagoons has been growing steadily over the last centuries. For migratory birds such as the sandwich tern, this is an important resting ground on their journey to the north.
houses are lined up on the beach like pearls on a string. The Baltic coast stays beautiful throughout the seasons. This is Ina Maglijic's district. She's the head of Heiligenhafen's Coastal Guard. Many of my friends joke that I'm up here on a holiday, but it is no fun and games around here. It's really nice to push the pedal to the metal from time to time. Everyone loves driving fast and it's double the fun if it's actually legal. Over the Baltic Sea with 60 HP. Only flying could beat this. Tough luck. These gents were going over the legal speed limit of eight knots, and they are being ticketed now. This can cost up to 250 euros. 27-year-old Ina used to work with the Navy before. There are only two women working for the Coastal Guard. The rest of the staff is male. Every morning, they leave their district station and patrol the area of Fiemansund. The island's 60 kilometers of coastline need to be patrolled. Coast guards always keep an eye out. Are there any boats with anglers? Do they have all the papers with them? Are people keeping out of prohibited areas or is anyone driving on the beach? The police on land gets called out all the time. For us on the water it's different. We have to drive around and see where we are needed. Ina has spotted a suspicious looking boat. She asks the skipper to bring his ship alongside. Every angler needs a permit for fishing at the coast. The Germans are well known for organizing nearly everything in their lives. Unlicensed angling is fined with 20 euros. But the skipper appears to be a good German. He has all of the required papers. His permit is valid along all of Germany's coasts. Everything is fine for Ina. It's all about the attitude you approach people with. If I were to look irritated and just growl at people, show me your papers, they'll obviously be unfriendly towards me too. But luckily, I never have problems with that. Ina bids him farewell and wishes him a nice catch. Fehmann's Bridge. The locals call it the Coat Hanger. The arch steel and concrete bridge spans 1,300 meters, making it the most important link for intercity transport between Hamburg and Copenhagen. Via Fiemansund, the route continues in the direction of Denmark. The railway and car traffic lanes end in Puttgarden. Here, all the traffic continues via ferry. They are commuting hourly to Denmark, which is just 19 kilometers away. Both the bridge and ferry route follow the migratory bird route. For thousands of years, migratory birds have been traveling along here to reach their wintering grounds in the south.
the island Fehmarn, Germany's third largest island. The first people who settled here in 5000 BC were fishermen and hunters of reindeer. Staberhof Manor is a reminder of the island's wealth that was garnered by farming the excellent soil here. In the island's east, the lighthouse of Staberhof appears. In the evening, men on the hunt gather beneath its beacon. For hours on end, they stand in the waves and work the waters with their fishing rods. On calm evenings such as this, Stefan Noting is guaranteed to be amongst them. Man. You start using a different set of senses. You become keen-eared. I start to hear the fish jumping. They make these smacking sounds at the surface when they go for the bait. And I can immediately feel even the tiniest of fish. Fly fishing is a fine art. I always liked the idea of catching fish with light equipment. I started in my childhood with a heavy sinker and some worms. The fishing rod I'm using now only weighs 100 grams. Outwitting a fish with such a small lure, that's what appeals to me the most. A true fly fisher ties his own lures. He uses feathers, fox hairs and synthetic fibers dyed in different colors. It is important to imitate the movements of the sea trout's prey to attract the fish. The secret of catching a sea trout lies with the lure. Which is why Stefan has an entire self-made arsenal of them. He spends almost every day at the beach. Stefan was born in Fehmarn. He knows that the island's people used to make a living off fishing. But here at the stony coast of Staberhoek, they wouldn't have stood a chance with their nets. I've been angling here for 30 years now. I know the area like the back of my hand. Angling is very relaxing for me. It's so much nicer than watching TV or sitting at the computer. It's back to the roots. Years of training with a fly rod are necessary for precise casts and headwind. Fly fishers don't use a sinker. They only have the weight of the fishing line itself to cast off into the distance. The sea here has a vibrant underwater life. Meadows of seaweed offer a perfect camouflage. Every fish traveling from the Atlantic to the Baltic Sea will inevitably pass Fehman's shores. Stefan enjoys going for sea trout as it poses the biggest challenge. The clever fish is picky and won't be fooled easily. This is why the lures have to be particularly convincing to get the job done. I believe that the eyes play a big role. The sea trout hunts on sight, and that's why I like putting large eyes on the bait. I think the fish can see it. Is it going to be his lucky day? The season is favourable, the water is cooler again, and there is only a slight breeze today. Sea trout are getting very hungry in autumn, as the ocean's food supply begins to drop. And what could be more tempting than a beautiful lure such as this? There it is, the bite of the sea trout. 
the fight is on. But the last defiant struggle is short-lived. If the hook is in the right position, the fish doesn't stand a chance. The sea trout is often called the fish of a thousand casts. Beginners usually catch a trout after only three casts. Then they're hooked, but have to wait for a year to catch their second one. It's not all about success. It's not all about bringing home some fish, even though it's nice, of course. My family is happy about every catch, and we love to eat fresh fish and prepare it in all kinds of different ways. Fehmann is the fly fisherman's El Dorado. For Stefan, every day spent fishing is a gift. He has never been off the island for a long time. He gets homesick after five days. Not everyone ventures here in a bid for some serenity. Those with the need for speed are looking for adventures here at the Baltic coast too. Some just get caught up on the island for the rest of their lives. Together, these two gentlemen are 140 years old. The surf twins, Manfred and Jürgen Chachula. 40 years ago, they've already stood on their boards in this area. They are Germany's surfing pioneers. One hour of windsurfing gives you a feeling that you would have to smoke three joints for to get it. You shall be happy with the world afterwards. All your worries, be it annuity or insurance payments, just stop to exist. You aren't thinking anymore. You're just surfing and surfing and you'd probably just keep on doing it unless someone would stop you. In 1975, Manfred and Jürgen were the first to surf the English Channel in tandem. Another time they surfed across the Baltic all the way to Norway. They have become living legends in northern Germany. Most 70-year-olds may start thinking about getting a place in an old age home. Not the Trachilla brothers though. They still like to show the youngsters in training what a real windsurfer is all about. Surfing together means falling together too. Je stärker der Wind the wind is good, it pushes your bones together for greater cohesion. Manfred and Jürgen were baptized together, went to sea together, founded families at the same time, and now plan to stay together until the end. In an old age home, they'd probably go like, geez, these guys are mad, we would never do this. Well, that's how I imagine it to be. Though so some of the inmates, they may actually love it and be all happy to go tandem surfing with us. I mean, we'd have to give it some thought first how we'd get their wheelchairs on the board. Jürgen and Manfred stayed in the Caribbean for years. They brought back the Calypso from there. They've always been a bit crazy, and they still are today. But Fiemann has always been home for the surf twins. In a way, this island isolates us from the rest of the world. I love to be able to say, let's go for a quick visit to Europe. And we just drive over the bridge. The people of Fehman will stay on the island, while the large flock of birds having rested here will continue their journey south. The coast of the mainland resurfaces behind Fehmann Zund. 
It's dominated by farmland and age-old villages. One thousand five hundred meters above the ground, Charles Scheffler and one of his sons are experiencing infinite freedom. The gliders stay below the clouds. It's the absolute freedom you experience up there. You feel a close bond with nature as you glide in the sky alongside buzzards, eagles, and even storks. It's about the pleasure of watching nature from above and the landscape it created. In the right light, in the right weather conditions, it looks incredible. One one to Echo Papa. Klaus is 1 1, Echo Papa his toe plane. After gliding along the coast for 300 kilometers, he's getting ready for landing. The midday heat at the airfield is almost unbearable. Klaus Scheffler's other sons are waiting for his return. They also want to go gliding today. Their father approaches without a sound. After a four-hour trip, in ideal thermals, he's coming down again. Today, he took his youngest son, Jonathan, along. The 14-year-old, his older brothers and their friends are all passionate about this sport, just like Father Klaus. We built the first models in school when I was 15. And then someone said that one of the boys in a higher grade went gliding. One of my friends was like, cool, let's go have a look at the airfield. We've been flying ever since, since 1975. The route is being planned in the tower. 18-year-old Tilo doesn't even have his driver's license yet, but he's got both his pilot's license and the license for solitary flights already. His father, 50-year-old Klaus, grew up on a farm nearby, studied engineering and made his hobby his career. I started working straight away for Lufthansa as a flight engineer. But after four years, I became a pilot. But I need to tell you that a leisure flight is one thing. Making money of it is a different story. Gliding is the fun type of flying for me. Every spare day between his transatlantic flights is spent at the gliding airfield with his boys. The latest two-seater is an ultra-modern sailplane made of carbon fibers. The glider is valued at 100,000 euros. It is being treated like a raw egg. It has to be immaculate for the perfect glide. Then it can reach up to 240 HP. Mr. Logger. Na, Piet, has the Aufgabe eingrogrammiert? Jo, jo. The logger, an electronic flying aid, is being installed. The route that can be taken according to the weather conditions and the thermals will be programmed into the little box. Launch sailplanes try to gain height using thermals or lee waves to remain airborne for hours. This is known as soaring. Experienced gliders can spend up to a thousand kilometers in gliding flight without using a motor. The highlight of a glide, the looping.
You just have so many more liberties. In an airliner, you are moving 180 tons through the sky. Obviously, they move differently from a glider, weighing in at only 300, 400 kilos. Gliding is a team effort. You need at least three people. The pilot and someone to fetch him in case of an emergency landing on a field. And of course, an aerotow to pull up the glider. Then there's the ground crew. Those starting to fly under Klaus's instructions will learn everything about team spirit and reliability first. Small mistakes may result in catastrophe. Within minutes of being aerotowed, Klaus and his third son have risen high above the ground. They are heading for the Baltic coast. At a height of a thousand meters, the rope is released by the pilot. At this height, nature reveals a beauty that cannot be seen from the ground. The new and amazing patterns forming the coastline. The sandbanks are marvelous here, and the deep points with the dark blue water, or those dark green areas near the shore where the seaweed is growing, this coastline just ought to be seen from above. We carry on towards Lübeck, with a quick stopover at Niendorf's harbour. In the summer, the beach here is lined with colourful towels and tan bodies. A more authentic coastal flair can still be found at the Fisherman's Harbour, only some hundred metres off the beach. Fresh fish just off the cudders is sold in the little booths. Mullet, turbot and places are popular. Working amongst the fishermen is Johanna Artmann, a potter. I was 12 years old when my father opened the pottery here. My father wanted to open a new pottery. He saw this half-collapsed cottage. It had some ceiling and some floor left. There was something rustic about it. He thought that it was a nice location because of the proximity to the harbour. So he got the cottage and turned it into his workshop. Today, Johanna is a permanent fixture in Niendorf Harbour. Her father has moved out. At the age of 23, she took over the workshop. Before she starts work in the morning, she meets up with the fishermen's wives, whom she has known since childhood. Here at the harbour, two age-old professions are carried out. Pottery and fishing are trades that have existed for millennia. As a potter, Johanna is carrying on the family tradition in the fourth generation now. She grew up next to the wheel. Water is very important to keep it smooth and you need to center the clay on the wheelhead to make sure it won't create ripples. The lump of clay transforms into a jar as if by magic. I'm not an artist, I'm a craftswoman. My intention is to create something that can be used. 
If it's beautiful on top of that, it's a bonus. I want to make proper, usable pots that please the eyes as well. I don't want to create art. I enjoy good old craftsmanship. Those visiting Niendorf can watch Johanna at work. The door to her workshop is always open, even at night. The kiln is fired then, as the applied glazing will be matured at kiln temperatures only. Most people associate pottery with a brown colour. But at the coast, brown won't get you very far. It's an earthy colour, which doesn't really suit the sea. So, you start working with the colours of the water and the sea. Blue and yellow. Light, friendly colours. The journey takes us from Lübeck Bay further inland. Ten kilometers from the coast, a city appears in the mist. Lübeck, the old Hanseatic trade capital. Right in the middle of Lübeck city island, a masterpiece of Gothic architecture has been enthroned, the Cathedral of St. Mary. Lübeck is full of architectural gems such as this. The Holstentor is one of the four glorious city gates. It is more than 500 years old. Lübeck used to be the centre of the Hanseatic League in the Middle Ages. The League was a confederation of merchants who wanted to secure the waterways against pirates. They established a powerful trading network in the north of Europe, spanning from Russia to England and further on to Holland and even Arabia. In the town's guild hall, the glory of old can still be felt by visitors. 200 European cities were once united under the leadership of the double-headed eagle, the crest of the imperial Hanseatic city of Lübeck. Until the year 1669, when their last assembly took place here. This is the grand key which locks and unlocks the town's guild hall. There are only two copies, not even the mayor has one. He needs to ring my bell to get in. The right of admission lies with me, but I wouldn't deny the mayor access, of course. Lübeck's guild hall was built in 1308, making it the oldest town hall still in office in Germany. The Hanseatic traditions are upheld in the city. Porter Gerrit Barr knows what is important. The Guildhall ought to be flawlessly presentable on any given day. Traditional Hanseatic virtues are still valued today. To be true to one's word, to be reliable, to shake hands on a deal, that's what marks the true citizen of a Hanseatic town. The Hanseatic League's High Court used to meet in the historical audience chambers. European politics were made between these walls and disputes among merchants were resolved. The discovery of America sealed the fate of the Hanseatic League. Trade with the New World became more lucrative than the goods traffic via the Baltic Sea. However, it is still considered an honour today to put your name down in the Golden Book of the Hanseatic Queen, an honour bestowed upon kings and a few statesmen. The Queen of Denmark, Jacques Chirac and Prince Charles have signed the book. And they are famous personalities. Even though I didn't get the chance to talk to them, I'm proud that I've had the chance to see them in person. As long as a good soul guards the town's guild hall, 
the story of the Hanseatic League will be kept alive. Like all the other stories still waiting to be told along the Baltic coast. <laughs>